As Sarah mentioned, I'm a surgeon. I uh, do general and trauma surgery and I work in the ICU, but my PhD work is in nutrition. And so it's been an interesting run of 35 years now of bringing nutrition sort of back to a surgical practice. The concept of where I really work is a concept of getting people tuned up prior to esophagectomy or pancreatectomy or big operations. And uh, it's also allowed me to work uh, on, on several things. I do a lot of international work. We work uh, in Chiang Rai, Thailand, and then Laos, and uh, Vincent Laos on several big projects with rice and several things. So I've had a very, been very lucky in my career to be able to work on this concept of good nutrition, changing things, changing outcome, changing cognitive function, and both and then come back to a clinical setting and work at the at medical college or at the Oregon Health Sciences where I work in Portland. So, you know, if we look at our global health challenges, uh, they're really tremendous. I mean, really, but it revolves a lot about this concept of inflammatory disease, you know, we're looking here. And really, if we look at the diseases other than the communicable diseases, which we see overseas, we're looking at cardiovascular disease, cancer, chronic respiratory disease, et cetera. And those are big burdens. I mean, they're huge. You know, I think this quote by Napoleon very well, he says the winner of the war will be able to control, the winner of the battle will be able to control chaos. Well, really, our approach currently is chaos. We've got government that doesn't really regulate much, especially in the last few years. Uh, you know, they take away a lot of the things we get to get put in our foods. There's a lot of craziness. I mean, you know, for years we've been having policy that hasn't really fit with the nutritional aspects. I mean, we, we give billions of dollars to healthcare, but we don't really address what's the bottom line to the disease. We're not addressing the inflammatory process with our education. We know it works. If we start teaching kids at, at the five and six and seven year old, that'll, they'll take home that message. And it's worked and we've seen that work. And uh, that's a lot of what I'm doing now at the end of my career is trying to get these programs into schools so we can teach these kids and start from day one with, pro with progress. But again, you know, we look at inflammatory states, obesity, cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, et cetera, all starts. And if we look at the, this slide's very interesting. It talks just about, it shows nicely what's happened here. We, all the infectious diseases have tremendously dropped. Okay, this is clearly not just 50 years ago, but this is starting at about 1950 to 2000, of TB, hepatitis, rheumatic fever, measles, mumps, all coming down because of immunizations and a public policy which affects those. But look at our inflammatory diseases going up, almost paralleling, in fact, about 10 years preceding what we recognize as our obesity crisis. So I think inflammation then is the root to many of these things. And as you know, this is not new, John Hunter, a famous uh, biologist and anatomist from London in 1794, showed us that inflammation has many diseases, associated with many diseases. So, I mean, it's a couple hundred years old. We've realized a connection. So I think that's the issue. So if we look at diseases associated with inflammation, it's tremendous. So, you know, you can see this big issue is virtually everything we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in a clinical setting is inflammatory disease. I mean, you know, even as a surgeon, we don't deal much with infectious disease anymore, except for necrotizing fasciitis, which rarely comes, comes in once or twice a week. That's about it. But so what's the driving force? I mean, what is it? What can we treat? I think we have to think about the GI tract as the main source. Okay, so if we think about, I like to think of the GI tract as sort of like just a, a, a tube going through us. You know, kind of like a river going down through us, right? But not only that, like the skin that has to protect us from the outside environment, you know, from the toxins we see and the things we put on our skin, but it also has to selectively absorb nutrients. So it has a bigger problem. It has to absorb some things without taking in the toxins. So it has to keep out the bad stuff and take in the good stuff. And so there's enough endotoxin in just one person in this room to kill all of us. So that's how efficient our gut is. I mean, that one cell layer thick, you know, that we see down there on the brush border in the area out here, is basically keeping us from dying. 
because of the endotoxin in our GI tracts. And that's produced by the bacteria and produced by the you know, purified E. coli endotoxins, et cetera, that we see every day. We use clinically to induce a hyperdynamic state. So I think, think about what the GI tract. So we're walking a thin line. You know, we're walking that tightrope basically between barrier function, symbiosis, and homeostasis, which is we'd like, to permeability and dysbiosis and inflammation. So I think that's why very little change, you know, in our microbiome and the bacteria can make that difference. So I like to think of the gut as orchestrating the inflammatory response. You know, because when you start reading and, you know, drilling down on this, it really is. I mean, if we think about that, we've got G protein receptors here that re respond to the metabolites in bacteria. We've got dendritic cells here that go out and sample the environment of what's going on and tell the immune system what to do. Basically comes back and regulates the T cell, the T cell that regulates the B cells. We know that these, these uh, basically the muscularis layer is altered by what's happening in the bowel. We see this every day in the clinical setting with once we've disrupted their bowel and done surgery, we know we alter the mechanical ability to pulp, to peristals. So really we have to think of the gut as changing. We also now know the association between the brain and the central nervous system. I mean, the gut-brain axis is a huge push now. And where did this all start? Well, it's actually fairly new. 1977 was this paper by Ben Eisman, University of Colorado, a surgeon who said, Maybe the gut is the source of multiple organ failure. Before, before that, before 1970, we all said, it's just the beginning of my surgical training, we all said it's related basically to infection. And all these people dying, and those they were dying of infection. And then Ben started with the concept of maybe it's multiple organ failure related to this uncontrolled inflammatory response. Not necessarily infection, although we spent the next 20 years going through papers that would say there's inflammation, inflammation, but we never could isolate the bacteria. Remember that in your colon, you've got several thousand back different species, or at least 1,500 different species in the U.S., of which only about 800 or so are culturable. So we're not able to culture them until we got our more modern techniques, we didn't really know. So we had all these people with these things, germ-free animals don't respond the same. So maybe there's something going on with the bacteria living in our gut. And so then we start saying, well, what about the microbiome? And this, this group, as you can see, is almost identical to the previous one. Inflammation, diseases related, microbiome changes, diseases related, and they're almost identical. We can parallel them. So let's look back at the sort of this history of this concept of microbiome, okay? So Metchnikoff really is sort of the father of our current concept of microbiome. Metchnikoff won the Nobel Prize in 1904 for the discovery of the macrophage, okay? And then he took his money that he won the Nobel Prize with, and he decided his interest was to, to why do certain populations in the world live longer in small villages, segments of different cultures, live longer than the surrounding villages? So Bulgaria is where he originally worked. So he went to the Yucatan Peninsula and found a segment that lived 20 years longer than the rest of the area, people in the area. He went to North, which is now North Korea, the Korean Peninsula, found a segment of people that lived longer, and he studied five different segments around the world. And he wrote an interesting paper in 1907. He, he said that there's the only thing they have in common was all of these cultures that live, old groups that live a little longer than everybody else in their culture, all took daily fermented foods. So in North Korea, it was kimchi. In Yucatan Peninsula, it was fermented llama milk. Okay, in Bulgaria, it was cow's milk. So they had a lactobacillus species intake on a daily basis. So that really got this whole concept started. In fact, he named lactobacillus bulgaricus, which was the first lactobacillus species named, and as you know, in the United States of America, be called a yogurt, you've got to have lactobacillus bulgaricus by definition. So that's followed us along. 
So we know then also that the surface area of the GI tract is about the size of a tennis court. So literally, if we take out our intestine, we lay it out, we take all the microvilli, spread them out, they're about the surface area of this room. And you can imagine that exposure, where it takes a little bit of toxin in an area like that. And we know there's 8 billion million bacterial genes and about 20,000 human genes and our different parts of our body have a different microbiome specific, the, whether it's the skin or the oral pharynx or whatever, you know. And we have about 1,000 species we can get by culture. Guy, University of California, Davis, spent his life culturing human stool. And in about 1985, he published a paper saying there's 750 species in the human stool. It took about two months to culture them all out, all the subspecies. I thought that was interesting, the poor guy. He did his own stool. I thought it was really strange when he put his kid's stool. And I have those poor kids. I feel, oh, Dad, not this rectal swabs again, you know. So, so, you know, so when you start seeing that, you say, like, well, then we started seeing changes in our ability based on some oceanography guys were able to cult non-culture by using 6NS ribosomal units. We can now say we know we've got about 12 to 1,500 species that can be argued maybe more, maybe less. We know that humans living in the United States have about 1,200, 1,300 species in our colon. If we go deep into the Amazon to a group that's never seen Western civilization, never had food that's, you know, done what's done to our food in our society, they have about 4,000 species. So the variety has decreased. That's one big issue. Variety is protective because there's redundancy. So the number of bacteria living in your colon helps us survive these perturbations, which we see normally through our routine daily life. Well, if you live in the deep in the jungle and you don't eat things in the Western society, we don't eat emulsifiers and pesticides and sweeteners and all these other things we do, we see the variety in your bacteria living in your colon are higher. Now, I'm not saying they live any longer as we do. In fact, they live shorter than we do. So I'm not saying we're all, you know, it's all bad. So if we think about this concept of the microbiome, it came to us from Joshua Letterberg, another Nobel Prize winner, and he learned, he learned his Nobel Prize by describing how uh, bacteria transfer genes and things like that. But he said, when we start talking about the human genetic machinery, the human genetic potential, we have to look at the whole story. That the bacteria, as you've seen in this conference, the bacteria living in your GI tract have epigenetic changes that will change on a day-to-day -day basis, that can change your genome expression, can change your phenotypic expression, not the genome, but change your phenotypic expression of your genome through epigenetic changes. So we have to conclude the bacteria, the fungi, the viruses, and the archaea, which are sort of a halfway, prote halfway prokaryote, halfway eukaryote. So if you look at that, what have we done in Western society? Change in our lifestyle, sedentary lifestyle, newborns, a third of our kids, and this could be actually about 24% done in this country now, are born by C-section, OK? Immunizations, domestic pets, parasitic infected refrigeration. And now we get down here where we start and see changes, in, as you've seen in the earlier lectures, the way we process our foods, additive, emulsifiers, sweeteners, antioxidants, preservatives, insecticides. Great data coming out now on Roundup. Very interesting data, how it alters your microbiome. And it's in everything, okay? And then we increase use of antibiotics, whether they're indicated or not. We have good studies showing about 50% of the antibiotics given in this country on a routine basis are not indicated. There's no bacterial cultures found, but given because that's what the patients want. This is a good example here. This slide shows us what happens to bifidobacteria, bacteroides, one of these subspecies, bacteroides, with a single dose of, broad, of clindamycin, which obviously is good to kill an anaerobe. Bacteroides are an anaerobe. Look at this. They took here. Day zero, the long-term effects of a seven-day course of clindamycin on bacteroides. It takes almost a year to get that bacteroides species back up to normal. A single dose of broad-spectrum antibiotics wipes out your normal flora. I know that when I give my patients pre-op antibiotics, I know I'm altering their flora. The worst is Cipro. We don't give it as a prophylactic antibiotic anymore because it's routinely 
known that that's gram for gram the highest cause, Cipro is the highest in, inducer of C. diff, Clostridium difficile. Clostridium difficile called, caused 24,000 deaths in the United States in 2013. Death, 24,000 deaths. I take out a colon about probably four years ago once a month for C. diff sepsis. Someone dying of C. diff sepsis, so I took out their whole colon. Now it's about, we're down, because our hospital's way down on C. diff because of our probiotic protocol. I'll show you data for that. Well, I don't know if I have the data for that. So the microbiome, there's all kinds of good data, and again, I don't bore you the details. But things like the average, you know, by age 10, the average American's taken 10 courses of antibiotics. 50% of pregnant fem females receive antibiotics during pregnancy. These have dramatic effects on our microbiome, which we have to think about these things. Are we doing the right thing? You know, so, so if we think about the microbiome, I like to think of the microbiome, in fact, as an organ, just like your kidney or your brain or your heart or your liver. Because what does it do for us? And that, it's not just passive there like we used to talk about. The microbiome now is actively involved in day-to-day -day metabolism. It metabolizes drugs. There's very good data now that if you're taking 5-FU for chemotherapy for colon cancer, if you have a sterile animal that takes 5-FU, it takes three times as much 5-FU to get the same killing effect. We know that the bacteria metabolize 5-FU to becomes more active in killing cancer. So the, the microbiome helps us. It metabolizes a drug that produces a myriad of vitamins and short-chain fatty acids. We know now that 7 to 10% of your leucine, leucine the major anabolic amino acid, it's the on signal for protein synthetic machinery within the cell. We've got, that's hard data. We know 7 to 10% of your leucine comes from colonic production by the bacteria. We have a transporter in your colon now that will trans, inducible to translate amino acids. We say medical students are still taught today that the only reason for the colon to absorb sodium and water. There's no nutrients absorbed, but that is absolutely wrong. Short chain fatty acids now, amino acids are absorbed from the colon, small amounts of amino acids. Hormone regulations, immune function, maintaining mucosal barrier, those things are lost when we lose our normal microbiome. So I think we gotta think of it that way. We know that the medical community, your guys are gonna be much more accepting of this, than the MDs, you might say, I've been fighting a losing battle for years, but I'm starting to win the battle. And you know, in 2012, we started hearing about the microbiome in lay press. The cover of the Economist magazine, Microbe Maketh Man, okay? Scientific American, you know, sort of a lay scientific journal, we started seeing 2012. So starting to see a few things come in. And now virtually every major medical journal and scientific journal has got a major article on microbiome at least once a month. It's everywhere. Nature, Manosal Surgery, uh, JAMA, all of them in 2018, routinely, because it's now part of our normal routine. It's hard, remember, it takes us 10 years to go from science, benchtop science, to clinical use. And we're just now coming back because we've had the science for 20 years. A survey just done a month ago, and just published a month ago, done about a year ago, in Canada against pharmacists across Canada. They interviewed like 600 pharmacists. Would you ever prescribe antibiotics for an ICU patient? 82% of them said, no, we don't think it's safe. Despite hundreds of articles, prospective, randomized, double-blind trials in two and 3,000 people showing it is safe in an ICU setting. So, needless to say, this is what we're dealing with. We, I have infectious disease doctors in my hospital still think we should not be giving bacteria. We should be killing bacteria, okay? I mean, that's what they told me when I first got. I moved from Georgia to Oregon 15 years ago. I took a pocket full of protocols with me because we had an ICU protocol in Georgia. It took me a year to get going. It took me three years to get going in, in Oregon. You'd think in Oregon they'd be a little more progressive, you know, but they weren't. They said, Bob, you can't be given the sickest people in a hospital bacteria. I go, but here's the data. And they, we don't care about the data, basically. <laughs> okay, so, so here's all the species we talk about. You know, 
But when we talk about species, now no in the next talk we'll talk about the importance of strain, but remember we have species and then we have strains. And just because you have a species that has one effect doesn't mean all the strains are gonna have that effect. So we know that everything affects the microbiome. It takes literally very little to affect the microbiome on a day-to-day -day basis. I like to look at this. Just international travel, we've got three studies now that show when you get on a plane in Los Angeles, San Francisco, and you land in Thailand, your microbiome is dramatically changed. A 16-hour flight change. Remember, the half-life of these things are anywhere from five minutes to 30 minutes. They divide. 16-hour flight, you get a lot of subdivisions. You get a lot of epigenetic changes that can alter them. My favorite study is this one here in dogs. When, you, when they took a family before they bought their dog, they cultured everybody in the family, oral pharynx, the stool, the skin, everything, different places on the skin, the hands. And then they did it five days, or three days later, seven days later, 14 days later, a month later. And guess what? All the humans living in that house became more like the dog, and the dog became much more like the people. And guess who's the fastest to change? Kids. Because I know like with my dog, when my grandkids come to the house, he's in heaven. Because they drop all kinds of food. And if they didn't drop it, they leave it on their face and he gets it off their face. <laughs> so I think it, it really happens. So, so anyway, all these things contribute to the microbiome and the rapid change. It's altered intestinal permeability once we get dysbiosis. And remember, variety is your friend. We want a variety of these things. We don't want to see decreasing variety, and one broad spectrum antibiotics like Cipro takes it from 1,000 species to about 250 within 12 hours. So that's dramatic. We, I'll show you some data in the ICU. But this, think what, if you think that happens in the community setting, what happens in the clinical setting? What happens when someone gets admitted, you know, I'm an ICU doctor, you know, I, surgical ICU, look what happens broad spectrum antibiotics, oral antiseptics, proton pump inhibitors, vasopressors, opioids, decrease in luminal nutrient delivery, parenteral nutrition. Starting someone on IV feeding, NPO IV feeding, they go to about 150 species within about 48 hours. From 1,000 to 150 when there's nothing going in the gut, within about 24, that's work out of Michigan, very good work out of Michigan, and that's a pediatric population. Okay, invasive devices. Good study here. People always said, well, just living in the, just working in the hospital makes you at higher risk because you have the exposure to these bacteria. Look at this. This is a very nice paper, originally published with culture data in 1969 in the New England Journal of Medicine, but now it's been repeated with our 16S molecular mechanisms. So these are people living and they've been not in the hospital for six months, they've not even walked through a hospital. Normal, healthy, free living people. This is the oral pharynx microbiota. This is just their, their swab. They swab the deep, deep back of the mouth, okay? Look at the number of pathogenic gram negatives, for nothing, hospital workers, no difference. If you're mildly ill, not requiring hospitalization, no change, but look at this. Moderate though, look what happens to critically ill people rapidly changing because of the critical illness. So that's what we have to define. We have to maintain a healthy microbiome sort of with these commensals and symbionts and not get into the situation with a pathobiome. Remember, we don't necessarily bring in bad bacteria. We allow with normal things, the bacteria living there change. They change their phenotype because of epigenetic things. Now here's a good example. Here is Pseudomonas, which you know is an aggressive Pseudomonas, can be aggressive. This is the same Pseudomonas here, and you'll notice on the left here, when they've been exposed to opioids, they become aggressive. Okay, no, we have endogenous opioids. Okay, you can do this with external opioids or endogenous opioids. So the bacteria are saying, hey, something's going on here to have this much opioids, I'm gonna become aggressive. I'm gonna now attach to the mucosa. So that bacteria, which is normally living in your colon, we all have pseudomonas in our colon, living there happily, doing fine, saying things are fine. I got plenty of food coming downstream, 37 degrees, pH in the mucosa is normal, there's no sense of stress here, and then you give them an injection 
you give, put in the media opioids or endogenous opioids or lindotoxin has been repeated with many different things, and you start to see those bacteria clumping and expressing on their cell surface an attachment molecule to allow them to become invasive. That's becoming, that's the problem, okay? That was in Science Magazine. John Alverdi has taken this concept and really brought it to us from Chicago, from University of, Chicago, uh, University of Illinois. So what he said is that we have a microbiome which becomes a pathobiome when we're stressed. Multiple operations, whether it be mental stress or be work stress, stress changes your microbiome, okay? So I don't wanna bore you with a bunch of rat data, but this study is very illustrative. What this shows us here is two animals. One gets a sham operation, the other gets a hepatectomy, so the, half their liver is removed, okay? That's pretty big stress on humans or on rats, okay? But in, before they did that operation, they in, inoculated in their cecum this bacteria, okay, the pseudomonas. Okay, so they inoculate both groups with the, with the cecum, and then they operate on them. So one gets a sham operation, open and closed, no real stress, animal wakes up, runs around the cage. Hepatectomy, they come out, they actually do pretty well, they come, they start running around the cage, but they're a little slow, so it's significant stress. Okay, then one, 24 hours later, they kill the animal, take out the bacteria, isolate the pseudomonas now, and then look at it, okay? And look at the survival. The animals, okay, 100% survival, and the animals, that got a sham operation. Remember, it's the same bacteria, just a different operation. The animals that got hepatectomy, 100% mortality. So just having an operation caused that pseudomonas to become from benign to aggressive and lethal. That's why it's important to maintain a healthy microbiome during illness. This shows you if you've had antibiotics, in the prior six months prior to an ICU stay, look at the mortality. If you're sick in the ICU, a 30% increase in mortality. If you got any antibiotics in the prior six months prior to that hospitalization. So, what can we do? There's lots of mechanism. How does you know how does having the right bacteria help us? Having a probiotic situation help us? Competitive inhibitions it inhibits. This is Lactobacillus ruteri inhibiting Staph aureus. It causes induction of heat shock protein, which is the protein produced by your cells to prevent stress from a, to prevent injury from a subsequent stress. Tight junction proteins. Noah will talk about this. It maintains the glue that holds your intestinal cells together, not to allow the toxins in. That's the bottom line on those. It enhances mucosal blood flow. We know that having the right bacteria increases blood flow 30 to 50%. This is a germ-free animal. This is an animal that got bifidobacterium theta. 50% increase in blood flow within 24 hours. To heal mucosal lesions, you've got to have good blood flow. Increases GI motility, stimulates gut immunity, help maintain the normal microbiome. That's C. diff colon right there. And then butyrate. Butyrate, we used to think, is only in the colon and it made by the bacteria fermentation of good fibers, of soluble fibers is our main source of butyrate production. It's about eight millimole in the colon. It's about eight micromole in a serum. We now know there's a transporter, a short chain fatty acid transporter in the colon to make the concentration going from low to high. That wasn't discovered until Ganopathy in 2005 discovered the short chain fatty acid transport in the colon. So this is relatively new stuff. So now we know that, because we used to say, why is it that people have less cancer when they have high fiber diets? They have less infections when they have high fiber diets. Now we know that as you, we produce short chain fatty acids, they get absorbed and we see increased killing by the macrophage. This is a macrophage right here, it's a small picture. There's a little gram-negative E. coli right there. You notice it's a green spot. For that macrophage to kill that bacteria, what has to happen? First, it has to recognize there's E. coli there. Just to send out a pseudopod, that's a pseudopod there. This is the macrophage, sending out a pseudopod. It engulfs that E. coli and then produces an oxidative or nitrogenous birch which kills the E. coli. 
We know that when you've got short chain fatty acids bound to that macrophage, there's nine or 10 different binding sites on a macrophage. When you've got why you've got butyrate bound to your macrophage, your killing is tremendously improved. You kill about, it's, some people estimate up to 20 bacteria before the cell undergoes apoptosis. Normally about nine bacteria are killed by a macrophage before it undergoes apoptosis. When you enhance the killing ability of the macrophage, you get better. So this is just a list of the short chain fatty acid stuff. Uh, it's Tremendous big list. We, I work on, we're working on several projects with our cancer group. Uh, we've been very lucky. We've been well funded by our cancer group. Uh, this uh, histone deacetylase we know is the issue and sort of the promoter for colon cancer. We know that's now decreased. We can decrease that promotion when we have plenty of the right microbiome around. So this is new data here. Very interesting. So we used to say. What is it, why do people do better with their rehabilitation after surgery when they've got short chain, when they have a fiber diet which gives them high rates of butyrate? So this paper is very interesting. Short chain fatty acids enhance muscle function and mitochondrial biogenesis. So when you've got butyrate on board circulating around and now you're rehabbing after a big operation or after a stroke, we know that essentially potentiates the effects of exercise and muscle maintenance by enhancing the number of mitochondria within the myocyte. Very interesting work. So let's look at a couple scenarios here. I got about 20 minutes left. So we got leaky gut, okay, diabetes and depression. Well, leaky gut we've all heard about, you know, and I have to say, on the I be, I've believed in leaky gut for a long time. The MD size, my partners go, give me a break, you know. A leaky gut, you know, business. So, you know, but there's data supporting and there's a data refuting, you know, so that I give you an equal balance there, but gut permeability. And we know the definitions, leaky gut refers to this, but, you know, sustained mainly by nutritionists and practitioners of alternative medicine. So basically saying MDs don't believe in it. That's probably true, okay? MD answer when you have Don Kirby, who's chief of GI up at Cleveland Clinic or chief of the GI section. Uh, MD standpoint is very gray area, so we don't really know. We're not saying it's not there, but we sort of don't, you know, sort of wonder, you know. So basically, you see all these sort of nebulous symptoms, right? Bloating, gas, cramping, fatigue, you know, multiple organ failure, sepsis in an inpatient setting, and then constipation, behavioral change, anxiety. You know, those are all kind of gray hard to get an objective prospective trial of these things. So again, there's lots of questions. But remember, our gut has got many different protection mechanisms. We've got non-mechanical, mechanical, the brush border is well healed, they rapidly turn over, remember three to five days from the base of the crypt at the top of the villus and they turn over. The mucous membrane is very thick, so the tight junctions are pretty well maintained and pretty healthy. But it doesn't take much to change that. Remember that microbial diversity, as we showed already, changes rapidly, is really what protects us. So, so diseases associated then with my leaky gut is so many. Again, hard to put a finger on a lot of these things, you know? Fibromyalgia, depression. I can tell you in the clinic when I see someone come in the diagnosis of my with GI complaints, I run it in my nutrition clinic as well as my surgical clinic. I see a lot of patients with chronic abdominal pain, and I see fibromyalgia, and I go, oh, God, here we go, you know, because I, you know, it makes me nervous because I think, what are we going to have here? You know, fibromyalgia and a chronic abdominal pain, I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be a long day, okay? <laughs> so, okay, so, you know, because there, it's hard, again, to put a handle on it. So there's all kinds of methods which we look at the mucosal maintenance and barrier. We know that some of those are disrupted and some people just are living a normal life. We know chronic fatigue, in fact, has alterations by some of these mechanisms which are done in animal models. It's easy, but it's tougher in humans to prove it. So again, it's hard to say. So what do we do? To, how do we recommend treating it then? Well, maintaining visceral blood flow, the right microbiome. For the clinical setting, early interval feeding, and probably with early interval feeding, and we have one project going on now with organic food, blenderized organic food versus the top of the line formula for ICU patients. 
And so and people are quite shocked when we start showing, look at the microbiome variety here versus this. You know, that'll be published in about three months. We've got a, two, more, two more patients enroll. So, uh, you know, that's a pro randomized prospective blinded trial. We've even had to put foil around the line so nobody could tell what's going through them. So, uh, so we minimize pharmacological agents, you know, lower the inflammatory stimuli, anti-inflammatory agents, you know, dietary changes, organic foods, decrease emulsifiers. If you ever want to see what happens to the microbiome with taking a salad dressing to have those emulsifiers, which every, virtually every cream salad dressing has in them, that is, I, I went home after I read those articles in Nature and Science, I mean, hardcore science articles, I went home and cleaned up my refrigerator. Threw away all that stuff. My wife goes, what the hell's going on here? Your refrigerator's clean, you know? I go, don't eat that stuff anymore. You know? So anyway, I go, N equals one. Well, what about obesity? Well, we know this is here. You can see the South really takes a hit. This is BMI. Okay, this is hypertension. And one of these hypertension, one's diabetes. And that, I can't read that. You can't read it. I can't. Wait. Yeah, physically inactive. Yeah, the glasses are not good for distance. So, but you can see they all seem to have a pattern here. The Southeast, North Carolina is in there, you know. So, but remember that sort of obesity is counterintuitive, right? So we have, you know, it's a life, we always used to say, oh, it's a lifestyle choice. People, they have lack of, you know, willpower, et cetera. That's really not the case. And I tell you, for 20 years, I did bariatric surgery, not because I wanted to, because I worked for the Medical College of Georgia, and nobody else would do it. So I had a lot of bariatric cases. And I used to go, you know, they just have to quit eating, okay? That's not the case. I've learned that through my studies in obesity and multiple projects I've been on NIH-funded stuff. It's, a, it's not just eating too much. It's not a single disorder. There's several dozen genetic phenotypes that end up being related, okay? But mainly, it's inflammatory. Remember that obesity is inflammatory disease. We know that people have higher CRPs. We have all their inflammatory markers are up in obesity. So that sets them up, right? If we look at, look at this with diabetes, a close association with diabetes, type two diabetes is proportion of diseases prevalent attributable to obesity. Type two diabetes, 57% of the type two diabetes in this country is related to obesity. So if we can cure that, if we can get these people eating right, will make a difference. That's not just one reference. These are all 2015, 2016 references, okay? Cancer, 30% of the cancer is thought to be from changes in diet, you know, in gallbladder disease, hypertension, et cetera. Look at the cost difference when someone comes into your emergency room with chest pain with obesity, 41% higher cost. Again, the government should say, we're paying a bill for 60% of this healthcare, if we just managed obesity, our healthcare costs would go down tremendously. So our education programs, I don't mean to get in that soapbox, but that's where we need to be focusing. So we get this metabolic inflammation, right? We see the pancreas altered, we see muscle altered, we see, you know, basically sarcopenia with increased fatty concentration of muscles, or so the function of the muscles is very poor, so low-grade inflammatory process. So the question then is can we by controlling, diabetes, controlling obesity and diabetes, change this trajectory? That's really the question. Well, look at this. We know that obesity is a tremendous change here. This is lean. This is bacterial diversity, which I talked about. Remember, is protective. This is right here, lean. This is obese. You can see as we get more obese, we see changes and we see increased bacteroidetes and less formicity. Okay, so this is again, this is a very good study here on human, this is transplanted stool. So they, okay, they took, what they did here was they took humans that were obese and humans that were thin, and they transplanted that stool into a germ-free mouse. And then said what, they sort of humanized GI tract, germ-free mouse, and they showed that guess what? The people that were obese, the, rap, the rats rapidly start gaining fat mass. The microbiome from the thin people, they stayed normal. So obesity was transplantable by transplanting the microbiome from a heavy person 
to a, from a thin person compared to a thin person. We know that our Western diet alters microbial diversity in mice. Again, germ-free mice, we take a Western, put them on a McDonald's diet and Burger King and Taco Bell and all these others, and guess what happens? We change it. We decrease diversity, we increase formicides, we decrease bacteriorities. Remember that switch we see, and even with people that lose weight, we see a switch back. After gastric bypass, we see a switch back to a more normal, lean person's not that I'm saying gastric bypass is the answer, you know. Increase in body fat. So again, we can change these with diet. This is a very interesting human study, okay. What they did here was they took humans, right, and then they took some of their stool and they gave either their own stool back to them or they take stool from a lean person, non-diabetic, and give that to them. This is a stool transplant program in humans. And then they looked at insulin resistance. So did insulin resistance change when a person with heavy person with diabetes gets stool from a, a light person, okay, a lean person? And you can see there, absolutely. No change in the ones who got his own stool back didn't change, but there you can see the insulin resistance goes down tremendously when they get stool from a lean person. So Big difference. Germ-free mice studies, you can see, this is, again, I'm not gonna bore the details, but the bottom line is, if you give uh, the bacteria to the wrong bacteria, germ-free animals will rapidly go, uh, rapidly gain. You can see mice are protected, germ-free mice, if you give them this diet-induced with no bacteria in your colon, guess what, you can't make them fat, even with a McDonald's diet. You give the same animal with normal bacteria, they're gonna gain weight. Germ-free mice don't gain weight. So again, endotoxin, you know, another way to give low-grade inflammation, low-grade endotoxin causes the same changes in the bacteria as well as in the liver. Feeding high-fat diet increases permeability. We're back to the idea that this fat changes, the microbiome changes, we don't know. It wasn't the fat that caused it, it was the microbiome changes that caused the loss, of the loss in these brush borders, these glue that holds your cells together, inducing a chronic inflammatory state. So again, it's just a diagram showing the same thing. Change in bacteria causes loss of this brush border, causes changes in the tight junctions, thereby we increase fatty liver, we know that's the case now. So again, very metabolically active by changing in bacteria. But what about the brain? Can we change cognition? Well, we now know that in fact, recently shown that we can give the gut microbial access involved in behavior, neurogenesis, neuroplasticity, we can give the right probiotic and see those changes. We can see significant changes in microglial cells. We now have human data on microbiome, there's a data now, Prozac versus probiotics, and they have almost identical on decreasing depression. Okay, so that data, anxiety and stress, depression, you know, obsessive, um, obs obsessive compulsive disorder, ADHD and others. Remember that 90% of the fibers in your vagus nerve, where we talk about the 10th cranial nerve, 90% of those fibers are going to the brain, not coming from the brain. So what does that tell us? This, remember the, the vagus nerve innervates through almost the transverse and left colon, the whole right colon. So it's taking all this information, 90% is being transported to the brain. Well, you can see what happens through the, the, this Microbiome affects the brain through vagal stimulation, through all the neurotransmitters and metabolites that the bacteria produce, as well as these microbially associated molecular patterns, the so-called MAMPs. So tremendous amount of input coming from the GI tract going to the brain. It doesn't surprise us that we can affect the brain. We have all kinds, you know, with, with microbiota absent and the germ-free animals, we see altered sociability decreased memory, increased stress response, cortisol. When you give an animal that's germ-free, LPS stress or shock or put them on a treadmill and run them to you know, exhaustion, guess what? The animals with no bacteria cannot go as long. They cannot, they increase stress response, cortisol, ACTH, epinephrine, norepinephrine, 
IL-1, IL-2, all those things are altered. So again, you know, it, it goes on and on. What about clinical use of probiotics? What can we show there? Well, I think we've got three ways we can do that, right? We can either resupply beneficial microbes, giving probiotics. Again, we've got to be careful with probiotics because it's not all perfect. We can give prebiotics, good soluble fibers, and now they've shown data that insoluble fibers also affect the mi microbiome, not as dramatic. Or we can give fecal transplantation, which we do in the ICU setting with overwhelming sepsis now and with C. diff sepsis. Okay, so let's look at this study. This was done in Lund, Sweden. They took factory workers in the Volvo factory, that just, very interesting, and they said, okay, if you take your break, half the factory that joined the study will get one red straw, which is coated with lactobacillus ruderi. The other group will get a straw with no coating, and if you drink three ounces of your drink, we'll give you a free drink during the break. But you have to drink at least three ounces of a six ounce drink. And they followed them for a year. That's the only thing they did. You got free drink at the break if you join the study. Okay, look at this. Number of sick days were cut in half. Pretty dramatic. Bl prospective randomized blinded trial. How about this trial? This is done in kids in New York State, okay? They gave these kids are four to 10 months old. You know, that they're fomites at that age, as you know, if you've ever had kids in a nursery school, they come home and you get everything they get, okay? They got a placebo here with the green. They got lactobacillus, bifidobacterium lactis, which is not much probiotic, probiotic activity, and lactobacillus ruderi. And look at this. Clinic visits, days absent from daycare, antibiotics prescribed. The number of antibiotics prescribed during that six months was down 70% in those kids. Now, you say, well, they, come on. This is done in New York State, where if they're gonna give a kid in nursery school, a teacher has to write down if they received antibiotics. So that data is pretty solid. Days absent, a little bit gray, but if you got antibiotics, that clearly shows that because in New York State, you had to prove it. Now here's one you're never gonna figure. When I read this study in 2010 here, published in British Journal of Nutrition, which is the high quality journal, published 2009, I said, give me a break. They gave probiotics to high risk pregnancy. Remember, high-risk pregnancy, over, women over 38, I think it is now, coming to the high-risk clinic. The bottom line is about 30, you see this is glucose intolerance. About 36% of high-risk pregnancies get glucose intolerance during pregnancy, during the last trimester. So what they did here was they gave probiotics versus control, right? Control group had 36% placebo, dead probiotics at 34%, and then active live probiotics at 13%. So gestational diabetes, you cut by half by just giving probiotics during the last trimester. British Journal of Nutrition, high quality. I still didn't believe it. I said, I want to see this repeated. Well, guess what? That was a landmark study, and everybody repeated it. And now in the journal Maternal Fetal Neonatal Medicine, which is the top journal in the, in the area, published in 2013, 189 articles, gestational diabetes reduced, fasting maternal fasting glucose decreased, preeclampsia, CRP, all decreased. 189 articles, that's a meta-analysis. Thousands of patients. Recently just published out of New Zealand, 2017, prospective randomized trial, 423, significant decrease in gestational diabetes. So clearly, we're altering inflammatory response in a pregnant woman with this change. Pretty easy to do, inexpensive access. What about necrotizing enterocolitis? These are babies that are under four pounds, basically, under 1,500 pounds or three pounds. They have about a 20% mortality, very low birth weight babies they are born. So we know what do they die of, necrotizing enterocolitis. So the concept was, well, let's put back some normal flora. These kids have no normal flora. They're born in ICU, basically go right to the ICU on ventilators. So what do they do? They gave 566 inf infants, 556, five probiotics, four bifidobacterium. They simulated what a healthy normal baby tried to 
figure out what they were growing, put that back in. Neck went from 9 to 5%. At my hospital now, we routinely give our very low birth weight infants bacterial infusions on day one of life. It took me four and a half years to get it through, but the pediatrician finally started saying, well, maybe there's something to this because there's an overwhelming amount of data now. Okay? What about surgical infections? You know, 14 trials, 1,500 patients, decreased surgical site infections, nominated to treat 18, and GI sepsis, all these things. Again, I'm not going to bore you with all these surgical things, but this one I want you to look at. This study is a landmark study. Okay, Nature, the best journal. I only wish I had more papers in Nature, okay? This is the kind of thing that wins a Nobel Prize. Okay, this is NIH funded, National, U.S. National Institute of Health funded in children for, to prevent sepsis in India, which is high risk. So these are not sick babies. These are healthy babies, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial, lactobacillus plantarum plus fructooligosaccharides. 4,000 infants, greater than 2,000 grams, so this is five pounds and above per, pretty much, all had at least 35 weeks gestation. So these are normal, healthy babies. Okay, they, came, this, they use WHO criteria for sepsis, NIH funded. They showed 42% reduction in sepsis in these kids. Remember, these are rural India. You can't afford big time medicine. Lactobacillus plantarum and fructooligosaccharides, one week of treatment, one dollar. 42% reduction in sepsis for a dollar a week. This has now been repeated with a 2,000 patient study in Bangladesh. It's ongoing study now in Laos, ongoing study. I haven't got the results of that yet. So, we can do this with microbiome changes. We can do, we don't need these fancy drugs. A dollar a week, decreasing sepsis. So what about C. diff? We, you know, we know what causes C. diff. Look at this, JAMA 2012 on antibiotic associated diarrhea, 11,000 patients, 60% down decrease in antibiotic associated diarrhea. Okay, what about C. diff? The first major paper decreasing C. diff, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial, British Journal of, of Medicine, uh, British Medical Journal, 135, C. diff zero versus nine at 53. That was the first big prospective trial. Look at this, the Annals of Internal Medicine. I know the medical residents carry this around in their pockets, best one, best journal. We, you know, surgeons, we don't, read, we don't read the journals, we look at the pictures. You know, but 4,800 patients, basically 4,000 patients, what do they find here? 66% decrease in C. diff. Okay, here is a big article just published December 2017, C. diff 1.6 from 3.9 incidents. 6,000 patient prospective trial, 19 published series, I mean a meta-analysis. The question was here, if you start pro antibiot probiotics the day you start antibiotics, you do not get C. diff. If you wait three days, which is what this study showed, timing is key, okay? But what about this one? Look at this, another study. Decrease 60% risk. The more bacteria you have, the more probiotics you have, the better chance you have. This is 6,000 patients publishing in this big journal, different group. So we've got multiple patients. Do they work? Does it work? If you, this is where I work here, the big hospital in the Northwest, the big teaching hospital. We went from 2.2 incidents in the ICU, people got antibiotics down to 0.7 by just institute and probiotic protocol. Cost us about 61 cents a day. Did, remember, one episode of C. dip sepsis, 100 grand. So you can buy a lot of probiotics. But remember, you can't just use any probiotic. This is a nice study done in England where they said, okay, let's see if we can give yogurt and prevent this, okay? So they took the most common yogurt sold in England, they then screened 17,000 people at 3,000 met criteria, and they basically showed C. diff no change. Because remember, it's a strain-specific, species-specific, so you gotta have the right species to do the effect. 
And I could go on and on about all these studies, sepsis, C. diff, ventilator-associated pneumonia, et cetera. But again, I won't bore you with that. A little bit on, on prebiotics. Remember, prebiotics is a substrate for the bacteria to produce. Prebiotics are, you know, these are usually soluble fibers. Probably the ultimate prebiotic is breast milk. There's a tremendous amount of prebiotic in breast milk. 15%, 15% of the carbohydrate in breast milk cannot be absorbed by the baby. You think about that evolutionarily, why on earth would we evolve to not let the baby absorb this nutrient produced by the mother? That nutrient is specifically not absorbed because it wants to make the right bacteria in the colon to give substrate to produce, produce increased lactobacillus, increased bifidobacteria. So mother nature is very smart, okay? It makes it that way. You know, the number one killer, I do a lot of work in Laos, the number one killer in the first six months of life in this world, not in the United States, but in the world, is still diarrhea diseases. So it would only make sense that if we give the right formula, mother's milk, it works. We now have one protocol where we're giving human milk sugars in the ICU in people with gut failure that come into us after multiple operations. So it's a very exciting area, and we now know it's not just the soluble fibers, but in fact the non-fermentable fibers. This is in a, a mouse model of sepsis. We can stop and decrease sepsis even with the non-fermentable fibers. So again, you know, fibers I can't say enough good things about. We now know these multiple papers, you can see all 2016, 2017, decrease in all-cause mortality by a high-fiber diet, decrease diabetes, coronary heart disease, decrease cancer, et cetera, et cetera. These are very good journals, very good articles to show that. Are they safe? The bottom line is the answer is yes. We give them in our hospital to everybody, transplant, liver transplants, everybody except bone marrow transplant, just got to quit fighting with the ID guys, okay? There's no data that hurts them, but there's no data that helps them. We know in liver transplant, we decrease sepsis. So that was an easy no-brainer. The transplanter said, okay, we'll do it. So I think we've got to start thinking about changing the way we do things, bioecological control, rather than killing bacteria. One of our projects now, we just got a big grant from the Nike people. Uh, Phil Knight from Nike has been very benevolent. He lives in Portland. He gave us $1 billion to study cancer. He gave us $400 million to study cardiac disease. And we've got a big project now going on with us in Combined University of Oregon. Not me a billion, he gave the university a billion. I just wish I had a billion. Anyway, uh, we now combine, we know that if you're in certain beds in our hospital, your risk of C. diff is higher. This is a skeleton map of our hospital. You don't want to be on 14K. That's where the C. diff is. So the, the architects at the University of Oregon now are working with, what about the, Fuck, the, the, you know, remember C. diff is a spore former. Spores from C. diff can travel nine meters. So we know now we're checking ducks, we're checking this, we're checking that all over the hospital. So that's part of that big project. So I think what we can say as I finish up here, eat a wide variety of high fiber foods that'll increase your variety, okay? Increase your diversity. Try to add fermented foods when you can. Minimize your food additives, the sweeteners, the stabilizers, you know, the, the emulsifiers, the pesticides. Locate a good source of local probiotics. Don't spend a lot of money. You don't have to spend a lot of money. They're not key. Okay, daily intake with a good prebiotic whenever you can, hopefully as vegetables and fruits. Okay, remember that watch out with some of these claims. A lot of probiotic claims are pure quackery. Association to disease does not mean a causation. We gotta be careful there. We, remember, we gotta look at the science. We can't just go with some crazy article from some crazy journal. Remember, more bacteria do not automatically mean it's better. Thank you very much. <laughs>